compared to other parts of the country, for example. Um, about 70% of the population lives in urban areas, and that, that is, you know, can be anything from sort of a, a town all the way up to a city like Kiev. Uh, exports include metals, energy products, food products, and, and machinery. Um, and certainly, with some of the research I've been doing lately, there, there is a, um, an effort to repurpose Ukrainian factories like sewing factories and other kinds of factories making small goods uh, and take in custom orders from European partners. So that is an ongoing effort um, within, uh, um, sorry, uh, within uh, Ukraine. Um, I wanted to say something about uh, religion, because again, this may have been something that you, that you heard, that you've been hearing about uh, in terms of religious diversity and what kind of religious diversity there is in Ukraine. There, more than half the population is unaffiliated and, and essentially identifies as non-religious, non not, not belonging to any uh, religious category. Uh, this is not surprising, given the fact that there is except in rural areas, very low rate of people uh, engaging in religious activity during the Soviet period. But if you take this part here and you turn it into uh, another pie chart all on its own, um, you can see that uh, the vast majority of the population is um, Christian Orthodox of some, uh, some stripe. Okay? So here you have uh, Orthodox, uh, um, Ukrainian Orthodox that uh, sus subscribe to the Kiev, Kiev Patriarchate, so they look to a religious leader who is in Kiev. Um, this is a very interesting group. This is the Moscow Patriarchate. They're also um, Orthodox, but they look to Moscow for their leadership. 14.7 um, is Greek Catholic, which is also called the Uniate Church. Most of the Uniate churches are in Western Ukraine, and that is, um, they, they uh, have both some um, contact with the Patriarchate and they also look to the Pope as well. And then there's also the, this small wedge here is the Autocephalous Church of Ukraine and they have their own Patriarch. They don't look to, Constanti don't look to Constantinople, okay? Um, there's also a small slice of Roman Catholics, um, Protestants, the, this, these are new since the end of the Soviet Union, a, a lot of evangelical Protestant denominations. Um, Jews make up a, a quite small percentage of the population, uh, as do Muslims, and most of those are actually located in Crimea. They're, um, they're uh, Muslim Crimean Tatars. Um, Buddhists, tiny slice there, and other churches and confessions. Okay. And then 7% uh, 7 7 said, I can't answer that question. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things, every time I look at an article from the BBC or from the New York Times, there's this phrase that come up, comes up, and then they tend to produce all these graphics that support it. And that phrase is, Ukraine is a divided country. It's a, or it's a country with many you know, deep-seated divisions. So th these kinds of phrases will come up. So I wanted to ask the audience, what are some of the divisions that you've heard about in Ukraine? Probably religious divisions haven't come up very recently, yeah? Russian speakers versus Ukrainian. Okay, language, especially Ukrainian versus Russian speakers, yep. East and west of the river. Okay, so yeah, left bank and right bank. So you've got a river that goes right through the middle of the country, a little bit more on the eastern side. And, and so you've got um, people in the east, people in the west. Anything else? Pre and post Stalin. Okay, so pre and post Stalin Ukraine, do you mean in terms of the, the things that were added? after the war? No, taking the post, the Stalin a, as after the war, the populations that were cleansed or moved okay. elsewhere or moved in. Okay, so um, sort of uh, different kinds of effects of um, Stalinist purges and other policies, including the, the famine, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah? Uh, Pro-Eastern, uh, no, European Union and pro-Russia. Okay, so pro-EU and pro-Russia, which also translates into pro-EU association agreement and pro-Russian customs union, which is a set of um, former Soviet republics that belong to a customs union together. Okay? 
So let's find out how some of these play out. And, and I don't, obviously, since I didn't know exactly what you were going to say, I don't have all of them covered, but I think some other ones like the pro-EU and the, the pro-customs union will um, come out in the discussion and also in some of these slides, okay? So historical inclusion in other empires, and this is what I mentioned in terms of um, uh, parts of the country that were only added after the end of the Second World War and Crimea was added in 1954. Linguistic divisions, ethnicity and degree of nationalism, political affiliation, uh, which involves sort of uh, this aspect of are you pro-EU or are you pro-Russia, and, um, and also uh, which parties are you more likely to support. So let's look at a few maps to illustrate this. This is a historical map of Ukraine, and what it does is it, it shows you, let me come over to this side, um, it, it kind of combines many different uh, moments in time when um, uh, in between 1922 and 1954, where uh, parts of, of territory were added to Ukraine and some small parts were actually taken off of Ukraine, but those are not necessarily important to what we're talking about today. Um, this part of Ukraine here, this is where I do my research, and that was added in the late 1940s. Um, this is the Ukrainian Socialist Republic. So this is the river that someone mentioned. And so you can see in 1922, you had this republic of the Soviet Union that was actually somewhat smaller than it is today. Okay? Um, the yellow parts, the Polish territory given over to Ukraine in the, um, late in the Second World War, although people who live there talk about it more as happening in 1946, 1947. Um, and then Romanian ter territories that were given to Ukraine include these pieces here. And then finally, you can see Russian Crimea given to Ukraine in um, 1954, okay? So you can see that in the 20th century, a country that had not been a really a country was kind of glued together and then included within the Soviet Union and became subject to a set of unified policies almost for the first time in its history. So I'm gonna um, say a few things about language because again, I think this might be surprising to people and, and I feel that this idea of linguistic division uh, does not give you the full picture of how language works in Ukraine. So on the 2001 national census, there was one in 2011, but we don't have the data available from that yet. 67% cited Ukrainian as their mother tongue. And you have to understand this is an actual question on the census. I was a census observer in 2001. And um, one of the questions we were focusing on was how people were asked the Ridna um, Mova, or what is your native language question. So 67 cited Ukrainian as their mother tongue, 24% cited Russian as their mother tongue, but Ukrainian Russian bilingualism rates are between 85 and 97%. So you can't assume that just because someone is a primary or a native Ukrainian speaker that they don't know Russian and vice versa. The rates are very high, and many people who work in Ukraine comment on, the, on this, uh, you might be sitting and watching a talk show, and the talk show announcer will be, the interviewer will be speaking in Ukrainian, but the guests are all speaking in Russian. And this is not problematic, because the expectation is that everyone on the show and watching the show is bilingual. Uh, I've had multiple conversations where everyone speaks the language they feel most comfortable with, and so you might have, you know, two-thirds of the people speaking Russian and one-third speaking Ukrainian, and it's not remarked upon unless the conversation is very politically charged, it's unlikely to be interpreted in terms of nationalism. It's interpreted as everyone um, using the language that they feel most comfortable with in an atmosphere in which bilingualism is the expectation. Most of the people who are monolingual live in, I'll show you in one of, um, one of uh, very few areas, okay? So this is the, uh, in yellow, I'm glad it shows up well on the screen, you can see a sort of a, gra a more gradation-oriented um, set of answers to this question. In terms of oblasts, there's 24 regional divisions within Ukraine. So you can see that over here in western Ukraine, you're up in the 90s, okay? Some 80s as you move over into central Ukraine. It starts to drop off into the 50s or so, but it's by no means zero when you get to this side of the river at all. But, and then even here in Crimea, 
Um, there's still 10% of people who claim Ukrainian as their native language. In, this is the independent little area of Sevastopol, and that's 6.8%. So you can see that there are very few native Ukrainian speakers there. And then 24% um, in this uh, region here, which is uh, strongly associated with Yanukovych, the former president of Ukraine. So by showing this, I want to show that there is some more gradation to this picture in here. Let me show you the Russian version, the flip side of this. This is in grayscale. I wasn't, again, I wasn't sure how the colors would show up here. But you can also see that the picture is much more gray. The picture is not black and white for Ukraine. And um, the frequency with which people have uh, contact with someone who speaks Russian or Ukrainian does definitely contribute to bilingualism. Yes? No, 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 and I, you know, definitely not Swedish and Norwegian. They're very close they're to each other. Each yeah, and and um, so I would not say that, but also not uh, as remote as French and Spanish. So the the one that the pair that I usually say is Italian and Spanish. It's very easy, given the right mindset, for Spanish speakers to learn, learn Italian and vice versa. But they, would ha they have to adjust. They have to learn some key sort of differences in the grammar and the vocabulary and the phonological rules to be able to simply understand what that other person is saying. It takes some effort. One of the things that's very complicating in Ukraine, I've been working in Ukraine, as my mother said, for over 20 years. And so to me, they seem very mutually intelligible. I know both of them. I'm fluent in both of them. But then I hear Russians from Moscow, for example, saying that, or people I know who are Russian tr English translators, they're Americans, and they are at the level of being able to translate, do simultaneous translation from Russian. And they tell me they can't read Ukrainian. And it comes as a shock to me. And that's when you begin to realize that it is a long-term process of exposure and as well as consci cons conscious effort to be able to, to do both. So um, the, the other thing uh, that I want to point out, uh, because people talk a lot about these divisions, but in fact, recent poll numbers um, are showing, I'm sorry about the small font. I was trying to squeeze a lot on there, but I'll tell you what's on the slide. Um, the, uh, a lot of recent poll numbers are beginning to show mm -hmm. that in certain key questions, there is a lot of agreement. I think this is important to emphasize because there are also, of course, certain areas where Ukrainians do not agree with each other. But just because there are political oppositions does not necessarily mean that the country is so divided that it should be torn apart necessarily. And I think many Ukrainians felt that way um, prior to the Russian invasion, that they felt like they had internal differences, but it was not necessarily something that someone needed to help them with. Okay? So 83% of Ukrainians disagree with the deployment of Russian troops in Ukraine. That's across the board. That's nationally. And these were um, numbers that were um, done before, right be in early March, right before the Crimean referendum. So this will include some poll numbers from Crimea. Crimea only has 2 million people in it, so they're not going to actually uh, significantly change, uh, change things. 93% disagreed in western and central parts of the country. So that's that part of Ukraine that's that you know, darker yellow color. 73% um, in the southern part of the country. That includes Crimea, Kherson, Odessa, all of those places in the south, and 68% in the eastern part of the country. Okay. So you still, this is actually when these poll numbers came out, a lot of people talked in Ukraine, talked about how important it was that there was a majority in every part of the country that um, was against the deployment of Russian troops. In Ukraine. When you say Ukrainians, are those Ukrainians that speak Ukraine? No. If somebody is, speaks Russian, do they feel a Russian? They still be living in Ukraine? Um, you know, that, that varies from person to person. This is 83% of Ukrainian uh, residents slash citizens polled. So this would be like we would call someone an American as opposed to, you know, asking exactly something about their status. That is a really important point, um, and that does vary. However, I think oftentimes those divisions um, erase a lot of Russians who actually would identify themselves primarily as Ukrainian citizens above their national identity. This is especially true among younger Ukrainians. And the sociological data supporting this are just beginning to come out. 
It's taken 20 years since the end of the Soviet Union, but you now have a sizable percentage of the population that identifies primarily as a Ukrainian citizen and not as a Ukrainian ethnic or a Russian ethnic. 61% um, support a unitary system of government. So this is uh, the, the system that Ukraine has now. Um, it means that there's not a bunch of little separate states stuck together that can you know, peel off if they want. It is a unified state as opposed to 24% overall se uh, supported a federation system where each individual unit of the country would have a greater degree of autonomy, including the ability to decide whether they wanted to remain in the federation. Uh, <coughs> actually, a fairly large percentage was um, undecided. And again, this is prior to the Crimean referendum. Um, these numbers do vary regionally, but again, they are all above 50% everywhere. 88% of Western, 85% of Northern, 66% of Central um, supported Unitary. 51% in the East, well, I, yeah, 41% in the South supported Unitary, and I think this was partly um, because of the Crimean referendum coming up. Um, in the Donbass area, 59% supported the Federation system. So there, there did appear to me right at that moment at the beginning of um, March a push towards the possibility of certain areas wanting to gain greater autonomy, and those were generally areas with higher uh, Russian ethnic populations. Okay. Um, what status should Crimea have? And this is the, the one that I was talking about that is just a screenshot. This is from a, a, a poll from a, uh, a, po a well-respected polling agency called the Rating in Ukraine. Um, so this I found particularly interesting. What status do you think uh, Crimea should have? And green status means autonomous status within Ukraine, which is the status it had prior to the referendum on March 16th. And you can see throughout the country, large percentages of, of um, people supported the idea that it should remain as it was, an autonomous region within Ukraine. Um, so uh, very few supported the idea that it should be a regular uh, region of Ukraine that was um, s uh, stronger among Ukrainians. Very few Russian uh, ethnics supported that. And, um, and then this, this reddish-orange uh, to separate and become part of Russia Again, somewhat higher among Russians, but only 17%, um, but not necessarily uh, by any means a majority across the board. Does that include a bar for Crimea? A bar for Crimea? They are part of the south, which is this one. So you can see that, I'm sorry, it's going to be hard for you because you're behind. So it says 19% um, were for independence and, and moving to Russia within this poll. Okay. And this poll was const constructed in a way that would be representative, so it's considered to have st statistical validity. Another division that people talk about a lot is a political division that is um, presumed to be in part regionally, in part linguistically, in part um, ethno-nationally significant. Uh, so I wanted to pull up the Ukrainian presidential election of 2010. These are the results of the runoff between Yulia Tymoshenko, so the one with the braid, I'm sure you've seen pictures of her, and Viktor Yanukovych, the square-headed guy who was previously the head of the Ukrainian government. Okay? So, um, so these are the runoff results. It's not the results from the five or six candidates who were originally in the race. Um, but again, I wanted to show you a picture that is more variegated than you see if you only look at that one that, that you know, c uh, aggregates where they got the majority and they turn it into a two-color map. There is a lot of variation here, and you can see exactly where Yanukovych has the strongest support. This is his home territory right here, and this is that same general area where there is a lot of support um, for a federation model. That doesn't mean that there's a support for people to, um, to move parts of the country into Russia, but there's support for a federation model which would allow people in these regions to have a referendum if they so de desired, okay? And you can actually see there are a number of places in here that are, um, 
that are uh, a lighter uh, blue, a green color. And then you can see the strongest support for Timoshenko was over here in the western part of Ukraine, which is not surprising as well. But if you look, for example, at these regions here, these are technically part of the west, but this is the region where I do my research. And actually, it was more, much more 50-50 in this region, much more 50-50 here and here and here and here. So um, I, I would encourage you not to be seduced by the ease of dividing the country into two colors. There's a lot, and if you look by individual sub precinct, you know, that then of course you see a much more variegated picture, just like you would in the United States. Okay. So what happened after 2010, Yanukovych won. It's generally considered to be a free and fair election. He was democratically elected. And um, then very soon after that, he jailed Timoshenko and um, for on charges that she was, uh, um, had been skimming money from gas and oil deals that she was involved with via her family connections of her husband, um, which is, I think, kind of now has been revealed to be somewhat of a farce since uh, Yanukovych has been accused of skimming $80 billion from the Ukrainian economy. $80 billion. Now, this is like, <laughs> I, can't even, I mean, it's almost the whole GDP of the country. It's like, I mean, not, not that, but it's certainly more than the current deficit of the country. So um, this is an enormous amount of money. His mansion that he abandoned in Kiev, the um, estimated value was $100 million. There were chandeliers that were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in there. There was a private zoo, a fleet of cars. Um, Stacks of money have been found in many ministers' homes. These were stacks of cash that were being used to pay um, people who were working for the government, those kinds of things. Okay? And I will say that also Yanukovych's son was the head of a bank, which after Yanukovych's election then became the bank of the country. So all the, the tra official transactions of the country were run through his son's bank, which is considered a little problematic. Okay? This is going to be a hard map to read, but it's in Ukrainian anyway, so don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> and um, I did want to also show this to you because the, it is not only um, the president that's important, it's actually the parliament that's important as well. And the important thing to see here, these blue regions, the, all the blue areas are, were run by Yanukovych's party, so that this was the majority, the blue was the majority in the parliament, the president and the parliament were um, you know, sort of a one-party system there. Um, and then various opposition parties and independent candidates are represented by the other colors as well. Again, you can see there are pockets around here of both independents and um, more centrist candidates in that mix. How much of that represents the opposition? Um, all, anything that's not blue is, is technically opposition. Though independent, you know, who knows why someone was an independent? They may, could be an independent because no one else agrees with them. But they could also be an independent who simply did not want to be affiliated for various reasons with a particular opposition party. So, you know, you'd have to look into each of these individual regions to, to figure out how the independents vote. But the pink and the red um, were both solidly opposition parties, as is the, the green and the yellow as well. But those are smaller I mean, this is really, this is only four here, you know, four here. These are relatively small numbers. Um, by far the largest party was uh, the Timoshenko's party, which is the pink. Um, and they had fewer than half the number of seats that were held by party of the regions in the parliamentary election. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of coming to the end of my fact, you know, like just hitting you hard with the facts, but... I did want to say a few things about Crimea. Some of you may have heard of Crimea through, for example, the Yalta Accords, which were held in Crimea, obviously. Um, but it doesn't, uh, but, but since then you may not have heard very much about it. It's a relatively small uh, region. It's uh, primary industries. Uh, there's some oil and gas reserves, but mostly it's agricultural, uh, um, Lots of tourism, and then uh, obviously some military installations there as well uh, as part of the Black Sea Fleet. I like Vermont. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, we've got a Black Sea Fleet too. But um, yeah, but it's very much like Vermont in the sense that um, agriculture and tourism are key parts of the economy. So things that are going to hurt, particularly tourism, are going to hurt the, um, the entire region. And about 60% of that tourism, last year at least, 
was domestic, meaning Ukrainians going to Crimea, and 25% was from Russia, the remainder was international tourism. But, you know, I think this is one of the things that people are worried about. They're worried about the idea that there will be no tourist season this year in Crimea, not Russians and not Ukrainians, in part because you see this little part here. That's what connects, that's how you get to Crimea on the railway. Most people get to Crimea via the railway. And so um, there's a, they're, they're trying to build a five-mile bridge. They said it'll take them four weeks, the Russians do. <laughs> <laughs> it'll take them four weeks and $50 million or over $50 billion, whatever it was they said. It's going to cost a lot of money, but they're going to do it fast, and they're going to get a bridge going from here to here so that um, Russians will be able to drive to their vacation destination in Crimea. Okay? So um, I do want to note that in, in 1991, 60% of Crimeans voted for Ukrainian independence. So they did not vote against, they did not vote to remain in the Soviet Union, they did vote to, re, to, uh, to be part of a Ukrainian independent state. There was some back and forth in 1994, they became an autonomous republic within Ukraine, the only one within Ukraine, and that gave them more freedom to make their decisions locally inside the region. 60% um, Russian, 24% Ukrainian, and 10% Crimean Tatar. These numbers are one of the reasons why people say it's highly unlikely that the referendum vote um, of 97% supporting uh, leave, you know, leaving Ukraine and becoming part of Russia can be accurate because it's, it's pretty unlikely that 34% of the population would have voted for, for that. Um, these are two populations that are very strongly against Crimea leaving Ukraine. Um, and that you can see... Uh, attaches to this region right above of, of Kherson. Okay. So I also wanted to, I, while I was reviewing poll numbers in the last week, I came across this poll. The residents of Ukraine like borscht and dumplings. That's like, so their favorite foods include borscht and dumplings. And they um, prefer meat dishes to dishes from potato. So, um, which is not surprising if you have, um, if you've experienced Ukrainian food. It, it that pretty accurately describes it. So, um, so I do uh, want to talk a little bit about the revolution and show you some images, and then I'll be happy to take questions. Um, so the Maidan, you know, the, one of the things I think people miss about this, because they probably didn't key into it maybe until January, um, when the really vibrant images of tire fires and so forth kind of hit the news. Um, initially, the Maidan demonstration, the demonstration on the... Uh, the independent square, Maidan means square. Uh, initially, it was about Yanukovych leaving the um, discussions about an EU association agreement. Uh, people who were very pro-EU and had supported the EU association agreement were extremely unhappy, and you know, a, a couple of thousand of them went out to to um, protest. And then a few days later, about you know, 150,000 of them came out to protest on a Sunday. Um, and, you know, things kind of went back and forth for about a week, but then all of a sudden on the 30th of November, um, the government sent <coughs> police out to violently disband the, um, the protest. So people had been sleeping and set up a tent <coughs> city on the Maidan. And after that, when polls were taken of people who were staying on the Maidan long term, in general, they said that one of the prime reasons that they were there was that they were protesting government violence against protesters, who at this point were entirely peaceful. There were no cases of Molotov cocktails being thrown or anything like that. Um, so this continued. There were a lot of attacks on uh, journalists. Uh, a couple people were killed. One um, activist was kidnapped and then his body was found dumped in the woods. Um, those kinds of things began happening, sort of piecemeal. And then on, um, in mid-January, the government imposed these really draconian uh, laws that were anti-demonstration laws. They also, and uh, people focused a lot on those, and many people, including in the United States, who supported those laws talked about the need to keep law and order, the, um, the fact that the demonstrators were disrupting um, the peace and that there was a potential for violence and lack of safety. But these laws also restricted the freedom of the press. They included provisions such as it is illegal to investigate the activities of members of the government or the police. That, to me, is, sounds much less like 
keeping the peace and much more like authoritarianism. So there's a whole range of things. Some of them were silly. You can't wear helmets in public if you're standing with more than three other people. You know, those kinds of things. Like, they didn't want people at protests wearing helmets. They didn't want more than five cars in a row. Right? They wanted to, to restrict people from assembling. Then <coughs> there was use around the um, 19th, there was use of force against protesters. There was a, a violent clash that was where you saw those the um, barricades emerging, people throwing rocks and uh, Molotov cocktails at the police, and several people were, three people were killed. And after this, things really kind of shifted dramatically to the point where many people who had been very neutral since then, many friends I have, suddenly were galvanized and they wanted to, they just wanted this government out. They had felt they'd crossed a line and that they were no longer going to um, be neutral about this. So there were a number of demands, early elections, the formation of a new government, demanding the release of arrested activists. Some people wanted Yanukovych to resign, but not everyone. And then there's another set of violent clashes that um, ended with uh, snipers on the roofs of buildings around the Maidan, shooting protesters with high caliber bullets. Uh, and at that point, about another 70 people were killed. And you know, including deaths that have happened since then, there were, they've been about 120 people who've died as the result of these Maidan protests. Um, 103 of them were on the side of the protesters and then there were a few uh, police officers as well that were killed. And one thing I will say about Ukrainians, when they, the, when they produce posters that have the faces of everyone who died, they have a section at the bottom for all of the police who died. They don't exclude these people. They consider it to be a national tragedy and they want to honor the memory of everyone who was killed in these protests. Okay. So who was at the Maidan? There were two um, interesting polls that were taken of people, like a thousand people, you know, so they did a sample, thousand people at the Maidan in uh, early December and in February, just to find out who they were and why they were actually living on the Maidan. The, the, these are numbers for people who were staying, um, they considered themselves to be permanent residents, they were protesting but also staying overnight. These numbers are slightly different for people who had only come for the day just to join in a protest. So um, in December, 49% had higher education, so this would be technical school or college. 81% were not from Kiev, so most of them were from other regions. Um, 42 from Western Ukraine, 33% from Central Ukraine, Kiev is in Central Ukraine, and 23% from the East and South. So you do have representatives of the East and South on the Maidan. 52% um, identified as Ukrainian speakers, 20 as Russian speakers, and 28% said that they used both languages equally. That's a significant proportion. Uh, main reasons for being at the Maidan were protesting treatment of protesters, that was over 60%, and seeking change in the country, and that was also up in the 50s. People were allowed to choose more than one region. Um, this cha the profile changes a bit, but I don't think dramatically. Fe by February 3rd, people have been killed on the Maidan, okay? So you have a very you know, different type of person that's coming and saying, I'm going to stay and, you know, and fight. 43% um, had higher education, 88% were not from Kiev. And most of that increase you can see came from people who, who came in from Western Ukraine to join. 24% uh, came from Central uh, Ukraine and 21% uh, came from the East and South. Um, slight increase in part because these people are coming from Western Ukraine, 59% Ukrainian speakers. 16% Russian speakers and still 24% used both languages. And their main reasons for being at the Maidan had not changed. Okay, so seeking, uh, s protesting treatment of protesters and seeking change in the country. Yeah? You say the sample size is about the same, a thousand of each. Was one in December, early December, was that relatively a small crowd in comparison to what February was? No, was I mean, 50, I, 50, I would say, um, well, in terms of these were not, th this is only of people who were staying on the Maidan. So we're talking several thousand. So it was a significant por uh, percentage of the people who were living permanently on the Maidan at the time. Okay. And I did, I, there's separate sets of numbers for the people who were only coming for a protest, and I, I just didn't want to include all of that uh, data on here. Okay. Um, so I know we can talk about this more in question and answer, but I wanted to address this. Many people talk about the far-right groups on the Maidan and they want to find out, are these groups fascist? I, are there, is there a prevalence of, of neo-Nazi symbolism or a neo-Nazi slogan um, kind of banding about or neo-Nazi thought on the Maidan? 
And the answer is predominantly, this is just a very small proportion of all the people on the Maidan, um, but they're there. And the thing that I've heard a lot of um, people who work in Ukraine who are part of a larger set of European scholars who work on far right and, and neo-fascist uh, thought in Europe is that um, there are members of far right nationalist parties in every government in uh, Europe and the percentage in Ukraine is actually a bit smaller than in some other Western European countries. So um, both the Svoboda party, which is a, an actual party, it um, participated in the 2012 parliamentary election and it had some elected seats in the, uh, in the Ukrainian parliament. And the right sector, which is sort of an ad hoc group that grew up out of the Maidan and has maybe 2,000, 3,000 members. These are people who are um, you know, prepared to fight. They're the kinds of people who would dig up their grandfather's rifle you know, and go out to the Maidan holding a weapon. Um, they're definitely people who are interested in engaging in conflict. Um, both of these groups can be considered far-right groups. Neither can now identify with or use neo-Nazi symbols or principles. And one of the things, one of the best explanations that I saw was a contrast between uh, the Russian government and the fact that it is based around a charismatic leader. It's authoritarian. It's highly nationalist in its politics. It looks much more like a fascist regime than what is being proposed by either of these groups. They are both very nationalist, but they could not have functioned um, well on the Maidan if they had been anti other ethnic groups. So they are pro-Ukrainian, and in that pro-Ukrainianism, it's possible that, they, that some of them um, say negative things about other groups, but they are not actively seeking to suppress the rights or anything else of other groups that uh, live in Ukraine or were on the Maidan. And one thing, people, you know, they're always worried that, these, that they're going to seize control. This happened in Hungary not long ago. There is a, you know, very far-right government right now in Hungary. But in a recent po um, polls, the Svoboda leader had 1.7% of the potential vote in a recent pre presidential poll. And um, the right sector leader, and this is not even a political party right now, had 0.9%. And that, I think, was partly name recognition because he's been in the news a lot. Okay. So there's no evidence of neo-Nazism at the Maidan, no evidence of discrimination against non-Ukrainian speakers or religious or ethnic minorities, and multiple leaders of these groups, Russians who were on the Maidan, um, leaders of the Jewish community in Ukraine have come out and said that this is a completely inaccurate picture that has been painted largely by the Russian propaganda machine. And I think this is an interesting visual that kind of summarizes the, um, the, the attitude of many Ukrainians towards talk of us extremists being on the Maidan. So this is a picture of Independence Square. In this picture, there was, this was probably about half a million people who had come to a demonstration on the Maidan and said, better to be these extremists, right, in scare quotes, than to be these kinds of extremists with no scare quotes. And this is actually a rally in Moscow, and you can see people dressed identically, lined up in neat little military rows, and demonstrating in a way that is much more evocative of, um, of sort of an extremist approach to, um, to government and to, uh, and to public display. Okay. So I'm going to finish up with a little bit of talk on social media. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I can show you some of these great images that I've been talking about. Some are very affecting, some are very, um, uh, some are funny. Um, and I, I always like to start with this. This is a post from Mustafa Nayem. He's Af Afghani, Afghani descent, but he's uh, lived in Ukraine and is a leading opposition journalist and has been very involved in opposition activities. Um, so he wrote on his Facebook page on November 21st, OK, let's get serious. Who's willing to stand on the Maidan until midnight? Likes don't count, only comments under this post with the words, I'm ready. When we get more than 1,000, we'll start organizing. And so this first protest had about 2,000 people. They were almost surprised <laughs> that they were able to get that many. That was the day that Yanukovych walked away from the EU Association Agreement. And um, that day as well, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who is now the, um, the temporary or interim prime minister of Ukraine, started a Facebook page called uh, Yevromaidan, and they had an event 
we are going to get together on Sunday and we will have a people's assembly um, for Yevromaidan in Kiev. Uh, one country, one Maidan. We are, this is the Ukrainian verb for are, and then, but it also is the, f the symbol of Europe, right? It's just the yeah symbol. So we are European. And they did get, um, I think, between 100 and 200,000 people at that first uh, meeting. So um, social media is extremely important in Eastern Europe, and I think some people contrast it to the United States where you know, it might be something that you do, but it's not something you're obsessed about. Um, Ukrainians and Russians are somewhat obsessive in their use of social media, uh, including Vkontaktia, which is a Russian site, has 20 million users. Odnoklasniki, this is more of a site that's used by rural and yes, less educated people, 600, 6 million. Um, Facebook has uh, doubled the number of users in Ukraine, um, three, uh, 3 million in the, um, from up from 1,500,000 in the past year. And then there are about 500,000 tweets a day that originate in Ukraine by Ukrainian users. Um, and I'm really going to, I'm quickly going to run through some of these um, different uses of social media and how they contributed to the Maidan movement. Um, I get mixed reactions to this. Some people are really surprised by how these were being used. Other people not. I'm going to start with tactical uses. This is an example of a Twitter feed from Euromaidan, which was, is the largest um, Euromaidan site. They have almost 300,000 likes on Facebook, people who follow the news that they put up. And here, for example, they're saying the metro is not running. Um, only, uh, the only way you can get to the Maidan is, is using this uh, collaborative means of get to the Maidan. It's, it's called get to Maidan. And so you can see how get to Maidan works. On this site, this guy is a, t a taxi driver. He says, I am taking people to the Maidan for free. Here is my personal cell phone number. You call me, and I will pick you up and take you to the Maidan. And when, that, when you have 200,000 users, you can, you can utilize this method of putting out information, and people can regionally find rides and get to the location that you want, even when the government has shut down public transportation, as they did during certain points. Yes, so that's the, this is the tag, um, get to my Don. So they would use that on Twitter, or you can actually search in Facebook by using this kind of hashtag, and the hashtag was in English in that case, yeah. Um, and here's this, uh, this sort of public service announcement, it's cold on the Maidan. <laughs> Dress warmly, you know. So, and they have this, you know, young woman going, hi. So this kind of use of uh, social media for very, immediate tactical information. I've also, uh, one of the things that was interesting is one day, Yevromaidan SOS, which was in charge of, of organizing things like food and stuff, um, they sent out something saying the Maidan hospital needs a breathing machine. They got a breathing machine. Someone like, like walked in with one, you know, a few hours later. I have also seen this used to identify corpses that were unidentified and, and um, notify family members um, to try and find family members of people who were injured and unable to speak. Kinds of things. Uh, uh, the uh, um, social media has been really important in terms of the distribution of information. And one of the things that you can see when I talk about graphic artists, people like cartographers, graphic artists, people who specialize in advertising, there are tons of them working, volunteering for the Maidan, and they produce infographic after infographic after infographic, such as this map, which they continually update. You can see this was from the 25th of March at 8 a.m., and by midnight they'd updated it again. This was a map of the countries that had condemned um, the invasion of Crimea, or the annexation of Crimea. And so blue, dark blue countries had imposed sanctions, light blue countries had officially objected, Gray countries had uh, nothing to say, and red countries were supporting Russia. Um, this is another type of an infographic. This, was, this one is in English. Ukrainian schools in Russia versus Ukrainian, uh, Russian schools in Ukraine. Um, there are no schools in the Russian Federation with the entire curriculum presented in Ukrainian, although 1.4% of the population is Ukrainian. 17.3% um, of the population is Russian, and 17% of schools are in Russian. So there's a number of Russian schools that corresponds to the percentage of, of Russian speakers in the country. 
Um, this is another thing that uh, you'll see. These are uh, profile pictures on Facebook. So this is that little icon that represents who you are. And prior to the Ukrainian Revolution, these all looked like they do in the United States. They were pictures of people or your cat or your, the cake you baked last week, whatever you're proud of, right? But you can see a, a change has happened. And now the vast majority of those pictures um, either show people in contexts that um, reflect a Ukrainian identity or use uh, overt symbolism of Ukraine. So um, like the Ukrainian flag represented in a peace symbol, this was an image that many people adopted as their, again, a great graphic image. This is a fence that turns into birds flying away. Um, this is the, the Tatar symbol, this, the, the uh, flag of Tatar. Stan, the, uh, not Tatar, Stan of Crimean Tatars. Um, this is the sort of thing, every time someone dies, people will change their profile picture to black, often with like a ribbon representing the Ukrainian flag, like you would with a portrait of someone who had died, Ukrainian flags, and so on and so forth. Okay. So when you look at Facebook, it's my Facebook now, at least, all those profile pictures, every time you make a comment, it's really colored, blue and yellow. Um, lots of different kinds of shared symbols. Um, here is uh, bochka connecting people. It's a play on the expression vodka connecting people. But here it's, <laughs> it's the one of the oil drums that people used on the Maidan to keep warm. Um, Be my Valentine. This is, I posted this to my husband's Facebook page on Valentine's Day. It's a Molotov cocktail with a heart in it. Um, uh, you know, th th this appeared one morning and it said, you know, have a Ukrainian morning, right? And it has the Ukrainian trident, which is a national symbol, national seal in the cup of coffee. Um, people also used different levels of appeals to action on Facebook. So here you can see this came from Euromaidan at a time that they were in mourning for the people who had died on the Maidan. And here's an explicit request. Um, please identify the guns in the hands of the Berkut, the riot police, in these photos. So they're asking people to send them information about who might have knowledge of guns. Uh, this was from a page called Euromaidan in English. And you can see here the Facebook icon is in a holster. It's being used uh, to... to uh, you know, fight back against the riot police there. So it said, information breeds democracy. Are you sharing your Maidan posts with your neighbors? Okay. Um, and then this one <coughs> just appeared earlier this week. A friend of mine posted this. And, and this is actually a new kind of angle. This is a, a picture taken, obviously, from the bottom of the giant mounds of flowers that form the ad hoc memorial to people who died on the Maidan. There's hundreds of thousands of bouquets of flowers, and it says, <coughs> send this picture to your Russian friend. And is sort of fighting disinformation. Um, let them think about whether to believe you or to believe you know, the Russian propaganda machine. Um, would people have brought this many flowers if only um, bandits and radicals had died on the Maidan? So sort of asking people to um, work on that. Also, of course, lots of humor. So this is <laughs> after the new laws went into effect, saying that you were not allowed to wear helmets on the Maidan. People put colanders on their head, and they went out. So these guys are really funny. There's a picture of them that circulated very widely. So this is an example. This is a tweet. And you can see all the hashtags. You have a Maidan, Ukraine, Ukraine laws, you're on Maidan. And it's a Twitter pic that people can retweet. So. Uh, this one I like. It's a missing poster for President Yanukovych. <laughs> <laughs> on the 21st, you know, he brokered this deal where there would be a new government, early elections, and then disappeared. Left his $100 million mansion wide open. No guards, unlocked doors. Um, people just walked right in. And were like, oh gosh, what happened to the president? So what they did is they kind of made a parody of the sorts of missing posters that had been circulating on the Maidan when activists would disappear. And you may have seen in the New York Times uh, about a month ago, uh, still about 250 people are missing who went missing in the last four months, and they haven't been found yet. So, um, attention, a person has disappeared. His, uh, his relatives are worried. So, um, he, did, he did show up again a week later at a press conference in, um, in a Russian city that is known to be the home of many uh, mafia bosses. He had a nice uh, public press conference. Um, as well, saying that he was alive. And then he disappeared and people said he was dead again. I like to follow the rumors of Yan Yanukovych is dead. And so these rumors reached a peak after a while and he had an eight minutes press conference where he essentially came out again 
to a press conference and said, I am alive, you know, I'm not dead. Um, this is another example of humor, it's, you know, uh, wor without words, all symbols. Uh, that's the symbol of the Russian Federation. Russian Federation, without justice, people drink, and they do drugs. There's a very high rate of alcoholism and drug abuse in, in Russia. Um, Ukrainian symbol, minus justice, Molotov cocktails, pitchforks. And the, f the final thing you're supposed to take out of this is Ukraine is not Russia. So I think this was um, meant to, to be a pushback. You know, it's without words. It can circulate broadly, but it was meant specifically for, for Russians in Russia to not underestimate the extent to which Ukrainians were going to, um, to uh, defend what they consider to be their principles. Um, this is a typical kind of thing you see a lot now, these comparison shots, how it is, how it could be if they had not stolen our money. Okay, and there are comparisons explicitly to European lifestyle with um, Ukrainian lifestyle. So the beat up bus, the, the tram that's a little outdated, those kinds of things. Um, some emerging attitudes. One of the things about social media, these, um, the, the, not only do the graphics roll over, but what is the, at the top of the list of what people are worried about keeps changing. Uh, this, um, the Skid i Zahid Razum, so the East and West together, is a tagline that has been um, really promoted throughout the Maidan. Instead of imagining this as the Russians against the Ukrainians, it's East and West together. So this is an example, you know, let's hug. Um, this is another one. Ukrainian, remember, when you give a bribe, you are building a new Mishiria, which is the name of that mansion that Yanukovych abandoned. And um, one of the things I will say is people have started posting personal stories about how they resisted corruption. I was pulled over by the cops for running a red light, but I did not allow him to, to demand a bribe from me, and in the end, he let me go. And these, like, these little minor triumphs of every day of resistance to corruption are are uh, circulate a lot on, on, uh, uh, on uh, social media. And certainly there is an emerging sense that people are dissatisfied with corruption and they're willing to resist corruption. This is, I think, a very interesting graphic. It's been going around for a while. This is the English version. And Moscow is our mother, so it's supposed to be Mother Russia, right? And yet all of the oldest churches, the foundation of modern Russia, is in Kiev. So all these old churches are in Kiev. And so it's showing that what was Moscow during all this time that people were building churches in Kiev? It was woods, empty woods, right? Uh, Putin hand, hands off Ukraine. You may not be able to see it here. This is half of Putin's face, half of Stalin's face. Um, you also see Putler, combination of Putin and Hitler. And you see a lot of um, uh, ways in which uh, Putin and Hitler are being sort of uh, conflated or um, Nazi symbolism is being associated with him. This is one way. There was a, um, this originally had, it was red. It was like Ukraine, and then it had a, um, and it had a it sort of red and black, so the colors of uh, Ukrainian far right nationalists and the um, Nazi swastika, right? So there was that, or, or um, just, you know, nice Russia with no swastika. And someone um, redid the sign, so it's like, this, this referendum is a joke. You can choose between Nazi Russia or Nazi Russia. There's no choice, right? <laughs> um, and it was uh, widely criticized as being a referendum with no no vote. There was no way to vote no. Um, so um, <laughs> I like this one. It just showed up. I think this just came up on Wednesday. So they've, what they've done is sort of combined their bodies. Um, this is a new line since Timoshenko was released from jail. People have been very ardently negative about her candidacy for president, in part because they are concerned that she is part of the old guard and she is more likely to end up being a new Yanukovych, being Putin's right-hand woman in the presidential uh, position. So, uh, yeah, I like the way the skirt looks you know, <laughs> on him. Um, something else that's been going on is just my feed is flooded with people telling me to boycott Russian goods. Um, choose things that begin with a 4.6 are uh, produced in Russia, things that begin with a 4.8.2 are produced in um, Ukraine. And so there's a real effort to boycott Russian goods. Another thing that was just circulating on Thursday was a picture of the UN voting board that showed 100 countries um, voting to condemn Russians Russia's annexation of Crimea, 11 
voted against that. Not surprisingly, Russia was one of them. And there were 58 abstentions as well. Who did China say? Um, China actually condemned it. They've been um, very vocal they, uh, in condemning the action. I'm, you know, I hear I could be made a liar, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. They were part of the, did they abstain? Yeah, they yeah. abstained. They abstain. But they had actually vocally condemned the action, the invasion. Um, of Russia, although someone did point out that they had also recently passed a law allowing them to intervene militarily in areas where large numbers of Chinese citizens were living. Guess where there's a large number of Chinese citizens living? In si Siberia. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one is just from today. I love this one because it's got that eco Vermont thing going on too, right? So I run, the, the bicycle runs on Ukrainian borscht, trains the body, and it's like, you know, it's, it's it's bravery, it's, you know, it's resolution. And it, um, this is independent Ukraine. The choice is yours. I run on gasoline of the occupier, because most of the gasoline comes from Russia. I eat up 56 billion hryvnia a year. I make my driver into spam, like sort of into canned meat. <laughs> so you choose. Um, but that was kind of new. Um, and then finally, just a couple of images looking to the future. I thought this was kind of uh, funny. So the burning tire is one of the enduring symbols of the Maidan, and there are a lot of pictures of people like little kids carrying tires to the Maidan, people in wheelchairs carrying tires to the Maidan. So it was a symbol of participation in the Maidan to be shown carrying a tire there to contribute to the tire fires. And so you can see the Kremlin, and the Kremlin is coming to Ukraine, and instead of greeting them with bread and salt, they will greet them with burning tires. I think this is a statement about the likelihood that Eastern Ukrainians would actually welcome a Russian intervention. And then um, this is my last image. It's from the Maidan. I believe it was taken in December. It's just a beautiful photograph overall. But I think a lot of people, this circulated recently, a lot of people took the message to heart, don't be afraid to change everything. And that was sort of the spirit for a lot of people of the Maidan. And many of the people who were very afraid of that change or very reluctant to engage in that change have had their views altered by the Russian invasion of Crimea. So I'm going to end there and I hope that that helps you understand what's going on in Ukraine a little better and now I'm happy to hear questions. Uh, a plan that's affordable for just the employee.